Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Triversity Talk. I am Stephen Bloomer T. And I am Wendy Stewart Kaplan. And we are so happy to be here with you on Sunday night. Gorgeous day today. A gorgeous day. Great gorgeous, day to be alive. Gorgeous weekend. <laughs> gorgeous I, I, weekend. I sent an email, blue skies, blue, blue skies, blue. and sunshine <laughs> and warmth. It's just been incredible. Um, but we are very excited um, for our guest this week. But before we get to that, as usual, whether you are on YouTube or Facebook right now, welcome. And if you don't mind giving us a like or a subscribe or a thumbs up on this video, that helps us get to a broader audience. So and we love it. Our egos need it. Well, yeah, but what he said about getting to a broader audience uh, and, 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 <laughs> and not, our egos. And our egos. <laughs> I just flat out keep it real. Um, but one more quick thing before we get started. Um, on November 10th, which is this upcoming Tuesday, mm -hmm. for I believe the third time, the Supreme Court is questioning the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, um, which provides insurance to 20 million Americans and provides protections for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and to talk more about this case, Triversity is co-sponsoring a town hall that will take place on November 10th at, oh, heaven help me, Seven, at 8, eight at, at, at 8 p.m. Whoops. Um, I was about to say 7, but at 8 p.m. Um, if you'd like to RSVP, go to www dot rdayincourt.org. I will that share that on the, yep, screen. on the screen. So www.rdayincourt.org. And thank you so much. And with that, Wendy, why don't you introduce our oh next guest? Oh my gosh. Guest. So our next guest is the one and only Ricky Boscarino. And if that name is ringing a bell, he is an artist, a sculptor. He has designed a total fantasy world that he lives in, his atelier, which is in New Jersey. And it's called Luna, L-U-N-A Park, P-A-R-C. And it is like no place you've ever been before. This is, Ricky is a true Renaissance man. Unbelievable. Absolutely. And we're excited to talk to him more about this. So everyone, please welcome Ricky of Luna Park. Yay. Hi, welcome. What an introduction. All right. <laughs> That's how we do it. We do it grand, Ricky. We do it grand. Great. Wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, we're so happy to have you here. I mean, you know, Stephen and I went to Luna Park a couple of weeks ago. A number of our friends who are watching tonight have been to Luna Park. Uh, can you just quickly tell people a little bit what Luna Park is about? Well, in order to really describe Luna Park, I have to let me let me give a little backstory. So yeah, we love backstories. So uh, uh, December of 1988, um, and I was 28 years old. Uh, I um, had uh, walked across this little bridge with my realtor. I was looking for a house, a little a fixer upper, and I uh, walked up the driveway and um, I saw this dilapidated little hunting cabin and it was all asbestos siding had broken windows a little dilapidated and as soon as I laid eyes on that house I knew that this would be the place I would spend the rest of my life you know I had an instant connection like cosmic karma you know whatever you want to call it I had an instant uh, connection with it and I turned to my realtor and I said Gail this is it and she looked at me and she said it is <laughs> it really was any normal person would have knocked it down and started from scratch. But uh, like I said, I was 28 years old. I needed a place to live. And with my skills that I had acquired growing up in a, an Italian household, uh, an Italian um, uh, uh, household of Italian carpenters, I was really confident that I could customize it and I could make it home. So uh, the night of my closing, which was uh, June of 1989, I stayed there that night. I started ripping out the uh, the paneling, and there was like mattresses and all this other stuff in the house. Pulling it out the door, making a big pile, and it has not stopped for thirty one years. <laughs> but that, uh, we will attest to that. That is the God's honest truth. Every time you go there, there's just another thing that's added. Plus all the work that you've done on the property itself, which 
it's too hard to describe. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. We've got this great little film. Yeah. I think this is a perfect time to a show A picture's it. worth a thousand words. A well, video is worth even more, more, right? <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to share a little video of Luna Park. And Ricky is going to kind of give us a little bit of commentary as we tour. So let's do this, you know, technical skills. Got to. It's all on Stephen. Here we go. Yes, here we oh, go. you did it. Okay, so this is a, uh, a film made by a good friend of mine, is Nick, uh, Nicholas Patrick, and uh, he goes by uh, Yeti Nest, and he did this about three years ago, and um, it's still like the best representation of the house. So uh, uh, I love the way it's done, Ricky. This is drone footage, right? Yeah. So he did this with his drone, and uh, he's an amazing editor. So he put the pieces together and. Uh, like create a kind of a story that kind of shows kind of really the scale of the house. Now, what's interesting is that, um, and you sort of see it that um, there's part of it like down at the bottom, bottom of the screen, that's the original house. Everything else is what I then added. So it went oh, from the little yeah. cabin in the front. Yeah, the little cabin in the front, and then that was 600 square feet and has now grown to, I think it's about 5,000 square feet. I'm afraid to measure it. But uh, but it's multi-leveled. It is um, uh, the the original three rooms of the house turned to fifteen rooms. Exactly. Uh, so filled from top to bottom with collections, oddities, things from my of my travels around the world, and it's uh, you know like a museum, uh, a legacy basically of my my life so far. So uh, it's an incredible museum, and you're right. This footage really does tell a story, and um, I feel like I'm right there in Luna Park right now. I I mean, to me, it just feels like Wonderland. I yeah, mean, it it's so amazing to be on the grounds, and oh, just gorgeous. Oh, here we go. This is be just beautiful. Now, this inside that we're looking at now, Ricky, this was recently added, right? Well. Uh, that room right there, that was, um, I started construction in 2006. Or okay. 2006, around there. And uh, so that was um, the original, um, yeah, if you get a chance to check out Yeti Nest Films. He's amazing. Nick is great. Um, so, um, so. So really, like every year you're adding to Luna Park. Yeah, I mean, all the time. I mean, there's, there's hardly a season that would go by where there's, not something going on either. It's uh, I am adding more mosaics to the side of the house. Uh, there's about about three quarters of the house is mosaic inside and out. So that's a that's a major part of my aesthetics is uh, the mosaic, and it could be made of all different types of materials. So that's um, it's like permanent, and it's you know it it speaks volumes. So uh, yeah, so there's never really a day if I'm home. There is something going on on the house, either inside or out. So. It's amazing. If Ricky home alone and he adds another wing. What do the rest of us do? That's I. I take frequent naps. Um, <laughs> well, I had the other day. That's true. <laughs> my uh, my secret is just like just keep moving. So uh, and uh, uh, fortunately, um, I'm able to have uh, some interns and students helping out in different things. So. So now I have a little bit of a like a little bit of a, a workforce, so I can actually conceive of larger projects with right. with assistance in mind. So I can conceive of larger projects, keep them going, and uh, in the and in the meantime, also uh, giving back to these students who are learning hand skills. They're learning all about aesthetics. They're learning about how to support themselves as artists. So that's a big part of my teaching. And that is also the reason that I established uh, a nonprofit foundation. So the Luna Park Atelier Foundation was created with the help of some friends and family members to uh, revive hand skills that are being lost in this yeah. current generation of digitization. Mm -hmm. oh. And um, so, you know, for me, growing up in a family of Italian artisans, I mean, everyone knew how to do everything. I mean, I learned how to learn use power tools when I was about seven years old. So for me, it's second nature, but I know for a fact, 
uh, with experience that a lot of these these students that come to me have very few hand skills. Yeah. So a lot of it is the reliance on digital technology, and you know, and I'm not a luddite when it comes to technology. You know, it's all here to stay, but. What I think, and I try to tell them, what's really important is you have to integrate it. You oh, that's so, that's so important, and that's a dying skill. That absolutely it really is. And I've had this uh, experience with uh, students, interns that have come here for you know many weeks, and um, they come to me uh, with very few skills. So sometimes we're starting from scratch. I literally I'm teaching them how to how to measure. You know, actually, how to measure, how oh, to oh. do, good, how to do, you know, a variety of things. I you know, wouldn't, wouldn't know how to do that. But it's interesting, Ricky. I know your background. You went to RISD, but nobody really showed you. You just you came from a family of artisans, and then you know you you found this little cabin with your realtor. How did how did you become such a visionary to know that you could just do this? I mean, it's quite remarkable. Well. And I have to go back to my my upbringing in a family where, you know, there was artisans. I mean, we had, uh, there were um, carpenters, there were furniture, you know, fine furniture makers. We had masons, seamstresses, <laughs> great chefs. Yeah, with all those. <laughs> Amen. Yes, how could you? Uh, wonderful kooky thinkers on both sides of the family. So in that kind of environment, you naturally like absorb information. And then... The more I, you know, you know, and I, I was also fortunate that my public high school in uh, Piscataway, New Jersey, had established an amazing art program. So I really got a firm foundation, continuing all through high school, and then my four years at RISD, and then uh, I did a uh, one year at, um, uh, at NYU Graduate Film School. I ended up going one year, but um, so that was all my basic my uh, my education. But uh, but I practiced. The, the craft of just making things and it didn't matter what medium it could be yeah. clay, metal, cement, glass, whatever it is, I was always practicing. Now, when I have my seminars for high school students, I tell them that, uh, that the, the creative process is just like academics and it's like S, uh, um, ac uh, Athletics, athletics and academics and creativity are basically the same type of disciplines. You have to uh, study, you have to train, and as a as an artist, as a working artist, you have to practice it every single day. It's a it's it's not something that you you do like a couple days a week if you really want to succeed. You have to train, and the more you train, the more the the process is that you can. Uh, you get ideas and ideas come to you easier. Right, they get ingrained you know, in your head, actually. Uh, and it's easier to translate them. You, you realize them. And it's just like academics and athletics. So I tell the kids, if you want to be a creative athlete, you have to treat okay. your creative practice as if you're an athlete. Yeah. So, that's so I'm like, I'm the universe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I, I think that people might get confused. I mean, with artists and performing artists that it's just, oh, well, you're naturally talented. And that can be true. Obviously, you are naturally talented, but it's so much more. And it's the time and the practice. And this is what's going to make you, you know, from somebody who has raw talent potential into a incredible artist. Do you find it's challenging now with kids that are, um, they're just wired different, right? Because they've grown up with with computers, they've grown up in a digital age. Do you find that it is challenging a lot of the time? Well, it's challenging to the a point like when when students come to me with you know no skills or very little skills, and then we're starting from scratch basically. But I have found that even um, even with that, that most students do have an interest in learning. A craft or you know learning how to work with their hands uh, and a lot of times it's just that they haven't had the opportunity and they haven't been exposed to hand working so i would say that's probably more so um 
it's very rare that I would uh, encounter someone, especially like an intern, mm -hmm. where they would not have an interest in even learning. Most of the time, they're just like starving to do things with their hand, but they just never had the opportunity. And one of the reasons is, and I hate to say it, it's, uh, you know, in our education system, uh, where uh, budgets are getting cut constantly, the arts are usually the first thing that get cut. And, you know, what they rely on then is, you know, digital, digital design or, you know, things that are easily accessible. You know, and inexpensive to put together. Yeah, I mean, there's not many, you know, uh, schools that have a ceramic studio or a wood shop, you know, where, you know, when we were all in school, I mean, that was, you know, you had to take shop or, you know, you had to take, you know, even home ec or whatever you had to learn these and it was required. Now it's not required. And I think that's, that's going to be a, a huge downfall. Problem. Now also you take like, okay. So I had an intern uh, a couple of years ago and uh, her interest really was in um, CAD, you know, computer aided design uh, and 3D printing. Now, the problem with that is that, uh, you know, you'll create a design, whatever, and maybe make a 3D model. And where does it go? It goes overseas. So there's all this emphasis on jobs, 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 jobs that are leaving the country. Well, there it is. There's one aspect. You know, we're losing we're losing the tactileness of making things because computer aided design and three mm. D printing goes elsewhere. So everyone's screaming about jobs are jobs, but the reliance on digital, you know, a tech, you know, the technology makes things go leave the country anyway. Things get produced overseas. And it, like I said, I'm not a Luddite when it comes to technology. I cool. use it. I, you know, I'm reasonably good at it for my age. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but, uh, but the reliance on that, you know, with I always thought that you should rely on your hand skills first, and then, then rely on the digital aspect of it. So. That's, well, yeah, mm -hmm. with what you're saying about that, you're talking about building a foundation with your hand skills, right? And moving moving into the digital aspect. It's interesting. We're talking a lot about creating, and a lot of what you do is creating. But a lot of the things you create are from collectibles. I know on your wish list, you've got um Ricky's wish list. I love it. License plates, bowling balls. And yardsticks. Could you collaborate? <laughs> Don't forget about the iris and peony root. Right, the iris and peony root. So, uh, so I used to gather so much stuff, like whatever I saw, whatever people brought to me, I would save it. I would cram it in my sheds, and maybe something would get used at some point. So, so I pared it down to just what I'm really using right now. So the wooden yardsticks. So I've been using them all over the interior of the house as wainscoting, as window trim. I cut them at uh, angles and little pieces. So I'm basically doing like mosaics by cutting up the yardsticks and reassembling them and, um, and doing like entire walls of yardsticks. And what's really interesting is that when you look at it, you can't quite see it from a distance. You don't know what it is. And when you, you know, actually go up and look at it, you know, people realize what, oh my God, those are yardsticks. Or And same with the corks. If you remember my kitchen, oh, the yeah. are covered with corks that I've nailed one at a, one at a time up, you know, in kind of vertical, vertical rows. And it looks like bamboo. And um, until people actually go and look and see, oh my God, there's like 30,000 corks covering all the walls in my kitchen. Uh, the uh, bowling balls. So started off as a kind of like a joke when I first, when I first bought the house, I had had a couple of bowling balls and I put them on a post in the yes. garden. And then then I had a dozen of them, and then I had like twenty of them. And then when I started opening the house to the public, people would bring them, and then I would get like ten at a time or twenty at a time. The last count was about <laughs> eight hundred fifty. That's amazing. So. so <laughs> Let me get this right. So people would come to tour the house and they would bring their bowling balls with them. 
<laughs> yes. Now, wow. I also have one area. I call it my family bowling ball graveyard because I have my my grandmother's bowling ball and my my well, all my uh, wow. my grandparents and my dad's and my mom's. I have them all in one area. So and they all and many of them have their initials. My grandmother's her name is, is Susan, so she has Sue, and hers is very special to me. So uh, so there are some special ones, but uh, yeah, there's about 850 around the property, and uh, that was the last. Pretty good. Okay. I mean, there might be more, but they're embedded in sculptures. Um, they're uh, they're inside the house. They're uh, the base for my uh, my kitchen sink. I needed a little bit of height, like about this much. And oh, I I it all. So they they kind of appear everywhere. So that's how I acquired eight hundred fifty of them. So now you use glass bottles a lot too. You have a whole structure made out of the blue glass. I love that. That's one of my favorite. Yeah, it's one of my uh, wonderful uh, sculpture. Uh, little, uh, it's like a little meditation pavilion. So, oh, it's beautiful. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that'll get finished probably next season, and it'll actually be covered. You know, it'll be a covered structure. So, but like I said, there's so many things going on right now, and. Uh, you know, there's always been a lot going on, and um, and I traveled a great deal. And uh, when the pandemic uh, struck, um, I had to really rethink my whole business model. Rethink, like, you know, how I was going to make a living because you know I'm I support myself in Luna Park 100 percent with my artwork. I mean, there is nothing That's else. Just yeah. Great for artists to hear that. With my artwork. So I had to uh, basically, um, and I used to do craft shows. Everything got canceled. My open house got canceled. Everything got canceled. So I uh, put everything online and um, really uh, kind of changed the whole way I do business now. And uh, so in that respect, you know, when I talk about technology, techno technology really saved my life in particular. So, uh, but um, yeah, I think... I think right now, anyone doesn't matter if you're an artist or what. Like adaptability is the name of the game. Yeah, we have to adapt, and we have to adapt to these situations that we find ourselves in now. Absolutely. The pandemic yeah. actually forced all of us. You know, it was a big eye opener in in many ways. Should be interesting to see how, what our life is like a year from now. Yeah, when things you know, people always talk about like normal and what the new normal is going to be yeah, it's really interesting where we look back on this 10 years later and look back on these you know these times right now so ricky who's your friend that's sitting next to you oh good thing you asked actually <laughs> who's your little friend so i started doing um this series of what i call face pots um in 2007 so uh they I would I would make these you know faces and um, and this is one thing that I started last year about maybe about a year ago but um, this year you know when everything shut down I really thought I need something new I need like a new thing to make and create other than jewelry uh, jewelry sort of kind of tapered off my jewelry sales and then I started really going full steam ahead with these, which I call uh, my face pots. So these are done on the uh, mm -hmm. potter's wheel. So this is uh, Frida Kahlo, the Mexican artist, one of my idols. And um, so the original piece is made on the potter's wheel and then her hair has been all carved and uh, the flowers in her hair. And she's right. even wearing a pair of my earrings. Oh, fantastic. Little skeleton earrings. She was very. Oh, oh, those are great. Those are skeletons. So, question: How long does it take to make um, Frida Kahlo? Um, you know, I, I, it's funny because I, I make several of them, you know, at one time. So, uh, but uh, they're very. Uh, the, there's a lot of steps involved. So here's uh, okay. Any guesses? Oh. Oh, I had to put on my glasses for this one, Ricky. Charles Minton, right? <laughs> he would be a good one, actually. Uh, Jerry Garcia. Oh, okay. oh wow. Uh, I was going to say Charlie Manson. 
Oh. <laughs> Ricky oh, Bobby. How <laughs> unusual. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. It's a bad guess. Okay, let's see this. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that is so cool. Stevie Wonder. Yes, good. Oh, I got it. Well, I did so bad on the last one. <laughs> How about... Oh, my gosh. How do you... Here, I'll hold it up a little closer. Okay, the hair, the lips, the eyes. She's beautiful. Yeah, I... Can you give us a clue? Yes, a hint. Stop in the name of rock. Oh my gosh. Oh, I love it. That's that is so... that's incredible. So... You know, I have to say sometimes there's more of a resemblance. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know. This is uh this is something that's um a fun one too. Uh so uh if uh Mostly our generation knows this one from the original Planet of the Apes. It is. Dr. Zero. Yeah. The irony is that's the one I knew. <laughs> I'm not from that generation. No, we're like one for one here. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I have um, uh, fun patriotic ones. So I do a whole. That's great. Yeah, do a whole patriot line also. So this is. Uh, and I love the stars in the yeah, eye. Right. Fantastic. Yep. Absolutely. So yeah, they're all functional. They're glazed inside so they could be used as flowers. And uh, yeah, there's like, there's over a hundred on my website right now. So they're all different things. You can go to your website, right? And order things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Website. So it's lunapark.com. L-U-N-A-P-A-R-C.com. And uh, lunapark.com. Make sure you spell park with a C. And yeah, I have uh, there's an online tour of the house and sculpture garden. There's um, some bio information about me and uh, and jewelry, ceramic. Jewelry. Um, I brought my earrings. I have a lot oh, of earrings. Yeah. Yes, I love those, Wendy. Those are, great. are my favorites. I wear these, and people are like, "Those are amazing. Where did you get them?" And Ricky, if you recall, I'm a clip-on girl. Okay, right. so it means a lot to me that you make earrings for people that have clips. These are also. Luna Park earrings, and then of course this pair. Yep. And stuff, what's so cool? It's just it's one of a kind. Which I wear this, and people are like, "Where did you get those fabulous earrings from?" I love these with the blue stones. Yeah, those are called Jane Jetson. What are they called? Jane Jetson. Oh, I'm Jane Jetson. Yeah, I like that. I... <laughs> that is very cool. And then we have this la last pair here, which um. I'm not doing a good job of showing them, but here we go. Great. I love you. You know what I love so much that you work in metal and then you put um, a jewel in it. It's it's really it's at such dimension. I acquired um, a lot of these. Uh, these are all antique glass stones, and oh. I acquired a lot of them. Actually, a lot of them came from Providence, Rhode Island. So when I was going to school, uh, there were these different houses that would sell all the old stock of just, you know, the gemstones, unset gemstones. So I've gathered them for years and years. So that's actually some of the main components. Those those mosaic pieces, that mosaic of yours. Yeah, so those are all uh, individual little glass stones. And I set them with a pair of tweezers one by one into the bezel. That's but, amazing. Uh, you must have good eyesight, Ricky. I don't, it's not too bad. I do wear glass. glass. <laughs> yeah, not that. too bad. But... Um, you know, uh, going back to uh, what I said about um, uh, my high school, my public high school, Piscataway High School in New Jersey, uh, having a, uh, they built us a new wing of the school, a brand new school actually, had a, a fine arts wing, which was really amazing. So that was the built, I think 1975, 76 or something like that. And um, they, um, I really got a solid foundation in my art. So that's what I think is it's unfortunate that I, I know for a fact that that program is no longer available at the school as is, and as are many anywhere, art, right? everywhere. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a real tragedy because, you know, the humanities are literally what make us human. And without that okay. connection, yeah. uh, you know, where are we? We're, we're lost in, you know, the ethers. So um, for me and my, uh, my, the nonprofit that I started, 
um, our focus is on on the uh, the hand skills and kind of returning to fundamentals of learning how to you know how to how to survive and how to how to create. The other thing that's interesting is working with um, the students. They come to us. You know, they live at Luna Park for their time as interns, and uh, I also find that um, they don't know how to cook either. I mean, very few. So a lot of times we're teaching life skills. <laughs> oh God, wow. on, top of, on top of art, my gosh. Yeah, we're, we're teaching how to cook, how to do laundry, you know, and, and the basic things that for some reason they're not learning, you know, at, at home or school or wherever or in life. You know, they don't even know that things are options for them. So a lot of times we're really, we're getting some of these students, uh, literally, and we're starting from scratch in a lot of them. How did they find you? Yeah. How did, how did the students that. find, you know? Uh, a couple different ways. So uh, sometimes we'll actually post, uh, we'll post uh, a position, an intern position at the school itself, you know, that most of them have uh, uh, internships and, you know, fellowships, that kind of thing uh, available. Um, so we post them there, um, and then we uh, we will also post it and kind of spread the word. It's kind of word of mouth sometimes. And uh, when I have the public gatherings, uh, and believe me, I hear so many times, "Oh, my son! Oh, my daughter! I, I want them to to work here." And sometimes I think, "Mm hmm, mm hmm." <laughs> <laughs> I, sell I tell them, you know, and every it's open, you know, for for <laughs> discussion. And I say, well, if they if they're interested, send me an email, and we start a conversation, and that's how we start. And if they follow through, then they'll get my attention. If they don't follow through, or if they're only like you know, you know, not quite, then then usually that's that's that it ends there. But if we start a conversation, and it's happened a couple times, I I could tell right away these kids are really really focused and enthusiastic. And for me, you know, the the fact that they come here with fewer skills is less of an issue than if they were enthusiastic. If they're really enthusiastic and if they really want to learn, then I'm all about that. You know, I will teach them mm -hmm. and teach them, you know, you know, whatever is going on here with that whatever media we can we can tackle, we can teach. Uh, but if they're not enthusiastic, then that's where it ends for me, anyway. So they have to be enthusiastic, and that's basically how it how it starts. So has there been a? I mean, so, I mean, you've been doing Luna Park and all this for a while. Has there become a legacy? I mean, are some of your interns now kind of making their own artistic? Oh, work? absolutely, yeah. There's uh, a few of them that. Uh, that have gone on to uh, yeah really uh, like supporting themselves with their with their craft or their art whatever that is so yeah and um, so I've seen then a lot of them have come back and to visit I've always kept in contact with uh, almost all of the interns and you know they're they're they become good friends and they come to help out and you know do like a special guest appearance so yeah so we've had some really wonderful real positive. Uh, relationships that we've built with. incredible yeah it's incredible when you're affecting their lives i'm while we've been talking i've just been thinking about this you must have had an incredible family support growing up i know you said yeah. you know it's a family I mean, artist but i get the feeling you had this close family where people were encouraging you when did you first start to show how what a special talented kid you were uh, you know really really early like when i was very very young um, uh, like one of the things I would do is I was whittling, like I would whittle wood. I would make little figures out of wood and I'd probably like, I don't know, seven, maybe seven years old. My dad taught me how to use a jigsaw when I was about seven, but I was always doing art. I was always making things as a very young little kid. And, um, yeah, I'd say by the time I was like seven, eight, nine, I was really, I was so focused. And even my teachers you know, noticed that I was really, really interested in art. So that was kind of a natural progression. And coming from a long line of artisans and artists from my family uh, and on both sides. Both sides, yeah. 
Yeah, on both sides. So it was it was so natural, and you know, it was such a wonderful environment to grow up in. Now I have uh, two sisters, one older sister and one younger sister, and they are both artists. And uh, my older sister yeah, does right. sculpture; she sculpts. And um, my younger sister is uh, an amazing carpenter and woodworker and um, sculptor. Um, she does amazing things. And my dad was amazing. He could pretty much build anything. Um, and my mom was very creative. She did all kinds of crafts, sewing. We, we all learned to, uh, to sew when we were very young. So, uh, so we knew how to sew when we were young. And, uh, you know, we could learn how to do some masonry when we were young. So, you know, it's like that's what we grew up in. You know, and our house growing up uh, was always being remodeled. So my mother would think of these wall treatments or window treatments. And my dad, you know, would do a sketch and they'd talk about it and then my dad would build it. So there was always, you know, things. And it's just like, you know, my house, my house is in this perpetual. Yes. I was about to say, <laughs> and grown up, Ricky has done exactly. yeah. evolving, And that's the way, and my I, parents is still that way. My mother will, uh, she's an, an amazing seamstress and craftswoman. So she'll make um, matching, uh, like a valance over the, the window with a matching bedspread. And then the next season she might actually dismantle it. And then the, uh, the valance then will become a tablecloth. And uh, you know, everything's always she repurposes everything. She repurposes it. You do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one thing we've never did, she never had the valances. Uh, she never took down the valances to make uh, jumpers for us, like in the sand. <laughs> <laughs> But wow. Not all can be Maria on track. Yeah, you know? really. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you know, and I know that um, I had this wonderful advantage of you know that kind of uh, uh, support in the family, and I know that's not the case because I know a lot of people who grew up, uh, you know, who grew up in artistic, who are talented, who do not did not grow up in an artistic family, and they had to really like really work hard to con convince their family of that to you know that that was that was valid and you know and to not be discouraged when they said no 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 you can't do that you can't support yourself as an artist and you know and that's all that's all rubbish and i really resent when when uh parents dissuade their their you know their children from following their passion for something that's you know going to Think they they think they're going to support them better when the reality is that in the United States and you know in many countries uh, art is a commodity and you know you can easily support yourself uh, well, not easily but it's like any anything you do you have to work at it and you know if I I try to lead by example teach by example for me um, I, I supported myself. I mean, since college, since, you know, like, you know, what, 30, you know, 40, 40, 35 years or more supporting myself, you know, self-supporting, self-employed artist. Yeah. I, I do think, though, you, you have to, that there's a lot of really good artists, but to be a great artist, you know, my, my husband has been supporting himself as an artist since he's 17 years of age, but he's incredibly talented. He, his family, they just left him alone. He was so out of control, nobody knew what to do with him anyway. He's still that way. I was but, about to say. Right. So they just let him be. But that passion was always in there. And I'm sure you probably see kids that are, are like that. You probably see parents that want their kids to be great artists. But you know what I'm saying? That spark isn't right. there. Sometimes it's just the kid has just got to be bursting with right. all of Art that they need to create. Now, you know, and since I've been sort of uh, vetting these kids, you know, these students, I mean, I can tell pretty well, like right away, you know, if they do have an interest, uh, you know, and even if they're not like good at mosaicing or whatever it is, I mean, I can usually tell right away uh, where where they're going to go, you know, and if they're going to really, if they have the enthusiasm to, to succeed or, or even just to be a part of what's going on at Luna Park. So, so Ricky, question for you. I mean, with, um, with parents who don't support um, 
art and their children, that there could be a gender component to that. Do you think that parents might be less apt to support, um, you know, a boy um, versus a girl in pursuing art? You know what? I, I mean, I have to say probably yes. That's probably that's probably true. I, you know, gender identity. Uh, it, it's such a stigma in our culture, probably yeah. more so than many parts of the world. Really, I mean, maybe not in underdeveloped countries, but but certainly here. That um, and I don't know how it is really so much so much today. Uh, but uh, there is an aspect of that. I think that is. Um, in our countries that, you know, boys were, were, are programmed to go into something that might be more, uh, you know, manly or, or, or it's manly. I mean, that's not across the board, of course, but, uh, but I think there could be a little bit of a, like a, a little bit of a gender discrimination when it yeah. comes to parents wanting their children to follow a certain path. I think Stephen really brought up a, a very good point because now what's heavily emphasized in schools is sports. All right. They, you know, like you're saying, they're not putting money behind the arts, but my God, football, you make basketball, baseball, you can get all kinds of scholarships to, to college with that. And there's, there's where they're putting their money. And yet like the arts to me seems to have, as you said, fallen by the wayside. It, it just, doesn't seem to be a great way to think. You know, we need to have everything. There needs to be a balance. Right, right. And I think that's the problem is that uh, that it's way, way out of balance. Out of balance, Absolutely. yeah. Extremely out of balance because, um, you know, like me, I mean, it, I couldn't do sports. I was like the worst, worst. Me too. <laughs> always the kid that nobody wanted on their sports team. I was terrible. So... Um, <laughs> But I would spend, you know, my refuge was the art room, you know, and that, uh, you spent your time doing art. Yeah, right. Much cooler, to play right. Sports. Right. 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 So, uh, you know, that's like I said, that's why I, I became the creative athlete, because that's where my strength was. Uh, and I did get the support from my my family members also. So I think that's what's mm -hmm. unfortunate is that, you know, some people who are really, truly talented do not get the support. Not only do they not get the support, but probably even discouraged from pursuing their passion. And I think that's in the long term, and you think of like the great picture of their future, of our future, being discouraged to follow your path is really probably probably one of the worst tragedies that could happen. You know, it's an everything. It's like, you know, this concept where, you know, having to support yourself and no, you can't support yourself as an artist. You have to become, you know, go into business or whatever. Um, and, um, and kind of in the same respect, if I can like digress slightly, but this is kind of related. So when I give lectures about Luna Park, I tell them that um, one of the great tragedies in our culture is this concept of resale value. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, resale this concept is it's been the bane of creativity because say if uh, someone did um, a mosaic in their house um, if they go to sell their house that mosaic is not considered an asset it will never be considered an asset in this environment it's considered a liability so that's why um, you know uh, uh, where I'm talking about where, where creativity is not valued, you know, things aren't valued, they're considered liabilities. So imagine if you were to buy a house and there happened to be a mosaic, you thought, oh my God, this is great. This is an asset because it's got a mosaic or it's got something, some unusual feature in the house. Um, there's a, it's like, it's like discrimination because there's something interesting or unusual about the house, which should be an asset. And in fact, it's completely the opposite. When you think of like the like the real, you know, the the idea of real real estate, like sellable real estate. So, well, I mean, we've seen so often these cookie cutter housing developments yeah. coming up now, where there's nothing original. They're all basically alike, and yeah, just even when they sell apartments in New York, they, the realtor will tell you, you know, we we want it generic. 
Here's right. what people want. They want white, well, generic. That word comes up a lot. White walls, pass through kitchen, the floor is done. They don't want any sense of personality or something that may make it different. But that's why you're here, Ricky. <laughs> I always had this dream of, of building a, um, um, a, a planned community, like a gated community, except we our gates would be gorgeous, beautiful, like all <laughs> filled. That's right, opulent. In the guard house, we would have someone wearing a giant plumed hat, and they would be the guard. And every single house would be different color, different styles, all mixed. Uh, you know, they'd be a a, 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 a road of Victorian styled houses, and uh, so that would be the community that I would plan. Okay, if anybody could do this, it's you, and right. you need to make this happen because I would be there in a I'll, flash. I'll sign second. up too. I I would love to live in a place like that. It's very Wizard well, of Oz. I um, you know, so uh, I was talking about the. Uh, did I speak about the the nonprofit, the foundation? You you touched on it yeah, a little bit. Okay, so um, so um, so in uh, about six years ago, I, I established the the nonprofit, and the first order of business was we uh, we were able to buy the house next door to me which is where we house our visiting artists and our interns. Yeah. So I've already started to transform this house and it's very visible. It's actually, you can actually, it's more visible. It's very close to the road. So Wait, I've seen that house, right? It looks like yours a little bit already. I'm trying to transform it. And once we do it, once we have a windfall for the, uh, the foundation, I really want to rip it apart or tear it down or something and rebuild it. So, um, um, my idea is that I would love to acquire the house across the street from me and maybe another house and start transforming it so that yeah. you walk, you drive down my road, DeGroat Road in Sandiston, New Jersey, and all the houses are all, um, you know, interesting and, and all, there's lots of art and art. And it's all about art. And fantasy. It's all about art and fantasy. Fantasy is the reality. Yes. We'll call, oh, we'll call it Rickyville. <laughs> Lunaville. Lunaville. I was about to say, you've got to play up Luna Park. Right, Lu Lu Lunaville. Ricky, now you make um, jewelry, you make pendants as well. Yeah, so uh, so I have a couple pieces to show you. So I'd love to see those. Here's a great piece. Yeah. So um, so this is okay, a related skeleton, even the jaw. I see. <gasps> Yeah, oh hold it, hold it up a little. Oh my God, he he talks. Spectacular. Uh, all the bones are all jointed. I actually have a real skeleton, a real human skeleton. So I model all of these after. Uh, of course you do. <laughs> of course you have a real human skeleton. That uh, is gorgeous. And then, so my signature pieces are now okay. So I was planning at one point um, when I was in high school. I had a real interest in science. So I uh, was heading into entomology as a, as a field, which is the study of insects. So I had this wonderful like passion about insects and I collected insects. Yeah. And um, I realized at some point that um, going into academics as a, as a career was not gonna work for my year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. So, however, um, so yeah, here is beautiful. So oh. this is a mantis. A mantis. It's uh, let's see. I might try to fill it. It's uh, fully articulated. I love it. Yep. The head. The detail. The detail is spectacular. Incredible. Yep. So the head is oh. articulated. He's beautiful. I can see his eyes. Now right. people can find um your art on lunapark.com, correct? Yes, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Here's a wonderful. Uh, this is a bumblebee. That's I've seen oh, those. Yeah. That's a, really look at that. Oh, I know. They're jointed. So this is a pin and a pendant combination. Oops, sorry. So great, beautiful, oh, Ricky. And my most favorite jewelry piece that I've ever made is this. So it's a um, it's a uh, a crayfish or a lobster. Gorgeous. The, the cousins, and mm -hmm. fully articulated, even down to the claws. Even the claws are articulated, My and uh, the whole the whole body. Oops, sorry, um, is segmented. Look at that! Wow. Yeah, they, they pick up a crayfish. They you know they do just that. They kind of tuck their tail under. So uh, yeah, and then there's some other fun ones like my my uh, goddess. Gorgeous. 
a whole goddess series. This is the goddess. What is shown on the goddess? So that's uh, that's an antique glass. Uh, a lot of these stones were um, made to simulate um, uh, natural stones. So this is a uh, it's glass with the uh, uh, foil to make it uh, simulate an opal, like a boulder opal. Oh, I see. yeah. Yeah, so I have a whole series of Now, what is the size of her? Um, like, it almost looks like two uh, corn stalks on the. Yeah, right over here. Uh, this is the goddess of the corn. Oh! oh. <laughs> Steven hit the nail on the head. I love that. <laughs> exactly. It's, it is the goddess of the corn. Ricky, yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. We should take some questions. Do we have some questions um, and comments? Let's see if we have some questions. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we might have more, it looks like we have more comments, but let's see. So Simone Krauss said, um, let's see, so interesting as young people, um, that apprentice under you, the best way to learn in such a situation, to learn is in such a situation and tradition, um, and, you know, with a teacher like you and learning certain skill sets, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. To get that opportunity to work with somebody hands-on who knows basically how to do pretty, it seems like pretty much anything in the art world. Oh, Richard, um, Dada wants to know, is there a visitor schedule? Okay, yeah. So um, so we're, there are uh, limited, um, limited days to visit. Actually, today happened to be uh, one of the days. Um, I'll uh, post it on um, social media, Facebook. And uh, on my website, when there are going to be uh, uh, visiting days, um, you know, with COVID, it's it's kind of put a big damper in a lot of things. Um, obviously, yeah. but, um, so uh, so I've kind of limited the, um, the 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 visiting days. Um, but there, uh, hopefully, I'll have one more visiting day. I will post that on my website. Um, it's all by appointment. Um, I'm trying to avoid big crowds. So. Of course. So do uh, by appointments and have a day where people can sign up for like time slots, you know. Uh, That's what we did the day we came as, you know, a small yeah. group. We had to see how many we were and we took a time slot it, and it was just terrific. And the beauty of it was we got to see so much of Luna Park, even though we were outside the whole time, because there is so much to see there. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And I, um, I uh, hopefully when we'll see, I mean, everything, everything in life is like, we'll see, we'll see next year. And uh, yeah, I mean, if I can um, start opening the house itself um, next year, oh my gosh, or yeah. June, or I don't know, maybe it'll be next fall. But for now, uh, the, um, the tours are limited to the outside, but there's a lot going on outside. There's a lot right? going on There outside. was so much to see. And, and anyone who's going to go there, what photo ops is all I can tell you. Absolutely. There's so many places to take pictures. So, so Ricky, somebody ask, um, what's next for you? You know? <laughs> well, let's see. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. It's, um, I feel like right now, um, I don't want to have to uh, reinvent too much more. I've already had to like reinvent every aspect of my life and reconfigure. And um, the one thing for me that that you know the pandemic and the shutdown has done is it's given me an awful lot of time at home. And the time at home has been amazing. Amazing for uh, some. And uh, and I have uh, you know I have lots of time to devote to developing the property things that I you know projects that I had put off for years and years, I've actually been able to do. So I've made a lot of progress on some really crucial things on the house itself that um, that I've been putting off just because I was away. You know, I would be away traveling to craft shows all through the fall and uh, spring and fall were really busy, which are the, you know, great times that would be really ideal for for working on the house. So, so for that, in that respect, um, I'm going to continue as I was. Um, I actually had two interns this summer and we had to, you know, we had to just make sure that, um, you know, everyone was quarantining before. So, you know, we take the precautions, make sure everyone was okay and safe where we, you know, we allowed and we made our, our, our pod a little bit bigger. So, so that's really what it's going to take at least for the next year or so, um, just taking the precautions so that, you know, we can all work together because it's, you know, we're in a, not necessarily a confined spot, 
but we're working side by side. So, yeah. uh, you know, and I think with precautions, then uh, I think that we can continue still uh, mentoring, mentoring and, and having interns. That's great. Yeah, that's absolutely. Simone wanted to know, do you get your interns from all over the world? I know now with COVID, we're very restricted, but are they from all over the world or? Uh, mostly like the ones we've had were all um, uh, from the US. Um, I think we had uh, one student from Canada, but but generally they're all from the US. Local, not necessarily local people, but people that I've come in contact with or, you know, somewhere where we posted the intern position at a school, you know, at a, car, a college. Mm -hmm. We've had um, a student from RISD. We had a student from the Art Institute of Chicago. We had a student from Pratt. Uh, we had a, a student from uh, Temple, University of Delaware. So we've had them from different places. Yeah. And they don't necessarily have to be associated with a college. But, um, but we do, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep that program. That's, that's really important for me. And no matter what, I always want to try to, to have a student at least one, maybe even two students per summer, per season. Of course, of course. Absolutely. So Ricky, uh, as we close up, I mean, we always open the floor for any plugs or any last yep. words you'd like to say. Well, I would like to say to all the young artists and maybe some of the not so young artists. <laughs> and, you know, I think that, um, you know, we might be, uh, we're on a, in a, on a, perhaps a new era for a lot of us, uh, a lot of the country. And uh, following your passion is going to be so important and not to get derailed by conflict. I mean, I think that's going to be really important uh, to, for, for people, especially young people, to stay on track. So if you're an artist, you know, keep, keep doing your craft. If, you know, you're academic, athletic, you know, keep, keep on, keep on keeping on. And I think that's what's really right. important, you know. I tell you, um, just talking to you tonight, the first thing I want to do is go home and practice piano. <laughs> <laughs> I will never be a visual artist, but I mean, I can perfect what talents I do have. And I'm like, okay, it's time to get to work. Hey, there's, there's something else. So if, um, you know, if, um, uh, people have, uh, you know, everyone's got a talent at something. You know, there is something, everyone's got some special talent where they're, you know, something that they're good at. And yeah, it's, uh, I think it's important to, to find that, find that thing that's good and then go with it. And I think that's what's, uh, I think that's what's going to save everyone is that if you have some kind of peace in your life, you know, because it's not up to anyone else you know, where, where it goes. I mean, it's really up to you. It's up to the end. So, yeah. So I think that's it. Follow your path, follow your, your craft and whatever that is. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't. And you know. I'm going to go home and nail things on the wall. You made me want to nail things on the wall. <laughs> I have things I want to go up. Yeah. Rearrange your room, rearrange your space. It's all, of, everything's about rearranging right now. So. <laughs> Right. And, don't be, and don't be generic, for goodness sake. No. Well, Take or, a risk. Yeah. Well, Ricky, thank you so <laughs> thank much you so for much. being here. Great. Excellent. And thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. And Oh, the website where they can, uh, we have the website up. I want everybody, you can get things on your website, right, Ricky? So, yeah, we'll share that one more time. A range of things. Uh, Lunapark.com. Oh, there it is. And remember, it's yeah. Park with a C. Yeah. Lunapark. With a C. Park with a C. Thank you. All right. Thank good you, night, Ricky. Everybody. And good night, everyone. Good night.